strike out and score a touchdown. Amen. <laughs> or a pin. Yeah. Or a home run. Amen. Would you let him know again how much you appreciate him by saying amen? Yes, thank you. Clapping your hands. And while Brother Jerry's finding his seat, you be finding in your copy of God's Word, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And you might have noticed Brother Jerry up here, that little hat on he had on his head, and the little streamers or the little tassels down beside his uh, sides there, and then him saying Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. He's part of a Messianic congregation. And when you think about Messianic, our Lord and Savior is Jew through and through. Amen? And they just come to know that their Savior is Jesus. And we appreciate so much, Brother Jerry. Aren't you glad that we have some teachers and coaches like Brother Jerry in our public schools? Amen? And so much supported by his wife also. We appreciate you so much. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, you have Paul's letter to his young understudy, even his son in the faith, what he refers to him as sometimes, even calling him so. And he's writing instructions to Timothy, who is now a pastor at a church. And now, when we think about the word instructor, we can think about the word educator, someone who leads us along the way. Many of you have memories of your school teachers, don't you? You have memories of favorite elementary school teachers, high school teachers. I remember fondly several of our high school coaches. One of the wonderful things about Facebook, I was able to get in touch with some of them uh, after several years, maybe 30 or 40 years of not knowing them. I said, hey, it's Cook, and they said, who? And, <laughs> and so you forget that a coach may have hundreds of boys come through, but when you go and go to school and you're coached, you know it's four or five coaches, and they remain in your mind and heart for many years, especially those who do well. Can you imagine like I did when I went to kindergarten, I had to remember my kindergarten teacher's name, just like all kindergarten students do. And her name was Mrs. Zikafus. Now, how would you like to have a name like Zikafus to remember as a kindergartner? Well, it was one that was hard to remember at first, but now it's one that's hard to forget. And our educators have played important play roles in our lives. Many of us would not be as intelligent as we are without those educators. We wouldn't be as far as long as we are without those educators. We wouldn't be all that we are without our teachers. But there's only so far a place or so far a distance that worldly education, worldly teaching can take you. And that's where the scriptures come in to take up the slack. And this is where Paul comes and speaks to Timothy concerning the importance of the scriptures that they are instruction for how to live a life in righteousness. You know, you can be the wisest person, or excuse me, the, more, the most intelligent person here on earth, and did you know that you can still die without the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and spend an eternity in hell? Knowledge can take you only so far, but wisdom can take you all the way to heaven. Brother Jerry was talking about his experience in coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a youngster. He says it really wasn't earth-shattering, and sometimes that's the case. You don't feel a chill going up and down your spine. There's no lightning bolt that strikes nearby. There's no kind of swoon that comes over you. It's simply taking God at His Word and believing by faith, putting your faith on the cross where Christ put our sins, and believing him and taking him at his word. You see, Jesus sometimes said, the uh, adulterous and wicked generation, they look for signs. Why don't you just accept my word is what he's trying to say. Believe what God says and know that what God says is true and that what he says, he means it and he means what he says. But on the other hand, it is heaven shattering when one comes to know the Lord here on this earth. He says that there is rejoicing 
in the presence of the angels over one soul that repents. And it is. Every time you lead somebody to Jesus, when you got saved, there was rejoicing in heaven. If you believe that, say amen. amen. You better say amen because it's in the Bible. And so how does someone come to know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? How does one come to know Him in knowledge and move beyond knowledge to the wisdom of salvation. Will you begin reading with me in verse 14 and notice that conjunction but, which usually means it's in contrast to that which has presently been said. And we'll go back to see that which is presently, uh, that had been previously said. And But what I want you to see now is what Paul is saying to his young charge, Timothy. But continue, that is, keep it up, be persistent, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now the antecedent to the word whom is in reference to Paul himself. Paul says you've learned some things, and especially he has learned some things from his grandmother Lois and from his mother Eunice. If you remember from reading in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, Timothy was raised in a broken home, a home that didn't have a daddy present at the time, and in a home where his daddy was Greek and his mother was Jewish, and in a home where grandmama stayed in that home, and yet they taught him the scriptures. And Paul is saying, remember, continue in those things that your grandmama and your mama taught you. I'm so appreciative of what Brother Jerry said about his family upbringing. And those of you who had mamas and daddies and grandmamas and granddaddies, aunts and uncles, or an older brother or sister that tried to teach you in the things of the Lord, you be so very grateful for them, and you thank God every day for those who taught you the things of the Lord. And he said, now I want you to continue in those things, Timothy, but not only in what you've heard from mom and daddy, or your grandmama and your mama, but also from what you've seen in me. And here's where Paul can not only be the instructor, but he was the illustration. And a lot of times the educator will say that children learn more by what they catch than by what they're taught. That is, they more by what's caught than what's taught. They want to see you living out what you are teaching them. Just like the preacher. Preacher, you need to live what you preach rather than it's preaching and living in a different way. And it always helps to know that the one who's teaching, the one who's preaching, the one who is the educator believes in what they're teaching. And so Paul says, you've learned from me. Remember that. And then he says in verse 15, And from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, again, in reference to his mama and his grandmama, which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I think it's very important for us to make note of that phrase, wise unto salvation. There are many that know about the Bible. There are many that know about God. They have a knowledge in their head, but they don't have a wisdom in their heart about it. That is, it hasn't moved from their head to their heart, to acknowledge, not only know what they know, but to acknowledge in their heart of hearts by faith that Christ Jesus is Lord and Savior. Uh, James said it this way in his book, in the book of James. He said, you believe in God, you do well. The demons also believe and they tremble. There ought to be a result in knowing about God that results in a transformation of life. For you see, the Bible does give us information. The Bible does give us inspiration. But it falls short in your life if you don't allow it also to bring along transformation. Again, it's more than just information. It's more than just inspiration. It ought to lead to transformation. And when Brother Jerry and other teachers are teaching at their schools, that's one of the things they're looking for in their students. Not that they just have book knowledge, but it makes a change in their lives. But only earthly knowledge can take you so far. It can take you to the top of a, as a CEO in a company. It can make you the best uh, teacher in a school. 
It can bring you that worldly wisdom where people come and seek your advice. But when it comes to getting to heaven, worldly wisdom, worldly knowledge can only go so far. We need something that comes down from above that teaches us how that we that live here below can go there one day. You see, the smartest physicist in the world can tell you how the heavens go. But it's only the Bible that can tell you how to go to heaven. And that's what we need. That's what we need to understand. And that's what we need to be praying for, that God would instill that kind of wisdom into the hearts and lives of our children, of our siblings, of our parents, of our neighbors, when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And it was Paul saying, remember these scriptures that you've been listening to and learning and maybe even memorizing since you were a child that they are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And isn't that our goal, that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? It was His purpose coming to this earth. I come to seek and to save those who are lost. Now, in helping us to become wise unto salvation and to live this life of righteousness and be instructed in righteousness, we need to know the Scriptures. Now, those of you who have said under my preaching before know this portion of Scripture and should be at least familiar with it. For all Scripture, Paul says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That is, it is a good plus in your life. It is so profitable that it's able to make you wise unto salvation. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I heard Brother Jerry in his testimony saying he just wanted to do what was right. And sometimes he started out not really going in that direction, but when all was said and done, you found Jerry where he was supposed to be at the time he was supposed to be. Now there's a parable in the Bible about that. There was a son that said, I'm going to do something to his daddy, and he wound up, he never did it. And then there's another son, a sibling, who uh, kind of him hauled around, but when it was all over, said and done, he did it. And he said, now which one is more righteous? The one that finally does it, amen? Now, we're all better off doing it right away, right? Not him hauling around about it or, or trying to think it over, just trusting God at His Word. Now, the first thing I want you to see is that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. It is not just the pen of man on papyrus and then later transcribed to paper and then reprinted on black print, on white pages, or even put on line or on the Internet. It is inspired by God as if God breathed it out. That's what inspired means. It's God-breathed. And it would be just like if you got up close enough to me to catch the COVID when I believe, breathe on you, you would feel it. God wants you to catch the inspiration from His Word. He breathed it out. And it was written down by holy men of old and recorded as God moved in their hearts and minds and through their hands. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And of course, up to this time, it's in reference to the Old Testament especially, but we now know that it's also in reference to the New Testament. And what, we, what has been written, Jude says, you don't add to it or take away, you contend for the faith once and for all delivered unto the saints. So it's God breathed. You can take God at His word. He says what He means, means what He says. And it's profitable for doctrine. Now don't let that word doctrine scare you. Sometimes you might hear a Bible study advertised, we're going to study the doctrine of salvation. You say, oh, that's going to be one of those drawn out, bored study, boring studies. Doctrine just simply means teaching. It is profitable for teaching. Teaching the Word of God that leads unto righteousness. Now, it tells you that it's profitable for doctrine that winds up leading us, instructing us in righteousness. That word righteousness means living a right life before God. Now, there's one aspect of righteousness we need to understand as those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that judicial part of righteousness where God declares you and me 
righteous through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when we place our faith and trust in Him. He justifies us and makes us right through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that knew no sin became sin that those of us who knew sin might become the righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Here is James Cook, a cusser, one who used curse words a lot, one who drank, one who was wicked, and one who was on his way to hell. And God saved me on a Thursday night in July of 1979, sitting in a seat in the Omni there in Atlanta. And He saved me and He justified me at that very moment. And if I had died the next breath, I would have stood before God as a justified saint in the sight of God. Was it because of something you did, Brother James? No, there was nothing I did. I simply exercised the faith that God gave me and placed it in the one who did it for me. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who became my sin died on the cross at Calvary. And when we place our faith and trust Him, God declares us justified and righteous before Him as if we had never sinned because Jesus paid the penalty for that. And therefore, there's that declaration of righteousness, that judicial statement of righteousness, our standing as righteous before God. Then, that's, there's that how we live it out after we've been declared righteous. It's like Brother Jerry said, we need to start growing and start going in the way of the Lord. And that's living a righteous way. Well, how do we know what's right and wrong? We live in a world today where one day something's right, the next day that same thing is wrong. And people are trying to change the rules as we go. No wonder we're a confused, messed up society. We go the way that culture wants to go. We go the way that the government wants to go. We go the way that the majority votes. And that can change. And it's always wishy-washy. You just can't find a foundation. I'm telling you, the foundation to find is the Word of God. It's the plumb bob. It never changes. God's Word is truth. It's amen and amen from the beginning to the end. And it'll never change. Truth can't change. If it was true yesterday, it's true today. It will be true tomorrow. And I'm trying to tell you to keep your mental sake as well as your spiritual state. Put your faith and trust in God and follow Him and find out what He says is right and wrong. And when you find out if God says it's right, you stick with it. I don't care if everybody in the world says it's wrong. You say it's right because God says it's right. And remember that you and God are always a majority. And it doesn't matter if the world says it's right, if the schools say it's right, if the laws say it's right. If whatever group is getting the publicity now says it's right and God's Word says it's wrong, you stand your ground on God's Word. Because when you die, it won't be the government judging you. It won't be the world, the culture judging you. It won't be what the latest fad is at the time you die judging you. It will be God and everyone will stand before Him and His righteousness. It is profitable for doctrine, teaching you what is right. It is profitable also for reproof, for doctrine, for reproof, teaching you what's not right. There's that balance. When you read the Ten Commandments, it'll tell you these are the things thou shalt not do. Or the first five say the, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Then it tells you in the last four or five, these are the things you don't do. And every time we look at them, we say, but I have where it says I shouldn't, and I haven't where it says I should. And that's one of the reasons that the Bible teaches us that is what's right and wrong so that we know that we're a sinner condemned and we search out a Savior and God says, I'm glad that you're looking because I've got one to offer you right here, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The law is a school teacher and it teaches us what's right and teaches us what's wrong. And we are the students and all of us in the classroom are guilty before the law of God. And yet he says, listen, you don't have to be in despair. Let me introduce the Savior to you. And there at the end of the chalkboard, the blackboard, the smart board. Brother Jerry, I was substitute teaching one time and I was standing in front of the, teach of the students and I said, 
look up here on the chalkboard. They just all looked at me, chalkboard. I said, all right, look up on the blackboard. They said, blackboard? It's a smart board, Brother Cook. It just dated me, you know, all right. And so at the end of the board here, at the end of the room, let me introduce somebody to you. And herein walks Jesus. He said, I'll save you from your sins. And so the teacher steps aside for the master teacher. And he comes and he says, I've died I've been buried and I've been raised again that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Woo! Isn't that something? It is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction. Tells you not only what is right, what's not right, but how to get back right. You see, the Bible's full of warnings and instructions to the backslider. Oh, it's hard to kick against the prick, the Lord told Paul when he was thought he was zealous for God and he was persecuting the church. What would you have me to do, Lord? And he told Paul, go see a man there in Damascus, and he'd tell him what to do. And Paul repented. There was Zacchaeus who was called down from the tree, and he said, Lord, if I've cheated any man out of his, his money, I'll pay him back fourfold. And Jesus said, certainly salvation has been found by Zacchaeus today. He's coming to his home. And the backslider is the one who's turned around from God. He needs to turn back to God. And repentance is something that we need to continue to repeat and preach from our pulpits and be practicing our pews that if you're not as close to God today as you once were, guess what? You've backslid, slid. And you need to turn around and get back with God. And it tells you how to get right with God. Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, able to convert the soul, not only to save it, but to keep it saved. And if you've been saved once, that's all you can be saved. But if you're not as close to God as you once were, then you're backslidden. You need to get back. And so therefore, it is profitable doctrine, reproof for correction, and for that instruction in righteousness. I told you about the football coach in college that had recruited a new coach to go and scout other players for his team. And when he'd go out and watch these high school players, the coach told his scout, he said, now there's that player to get knocked down and he won't get back. And the new scout said, we don't want him, do we, coach? And no, we don't. He said, then there's that player, he'll get knocked down, he'll get up, he'll get knocked down a second time, and he'll stay down after that second time. The scout said, we don't want him either, do we, coach? He said, no, we don't. He said, but then, son, there's that, that boy, he'll get knocked down, he'll get up, he'll get knocked down, he'll get up, he'll get knocked down, he'll get up. No matter how many times he gets knocked down, he'll get up. And the new scout said, that's the one we want, ain't it, coach? And he said, no, we don't want that one either. And the new scout looked at him and said, well, who do we want, coach? And he said, I want the boy that's knocking them down. <laughs> Far too many times we get on the defensive. We try to catch up. We need to take the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and go stomping, marching out of here as that old boy that's knocking down the devil and all these demons coming at him, taking up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the belt of, uh, the belt of salvation, and the belt of truth, and the shoes that are shod with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace, and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and let's go after it. You're not subject to this world. Jesus overcame this world. And we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. A teacher shouldn't be intimidated in the public classroom because of his Christian faith, nor should a student, nor should the local pastors God owns it all, and if God wants to get in a public school, if God wants to get into your home, if God wants to get into your neighbor's home, if God wants to get into a workplace, 
God can in any time He wants to. He's just looking for some of His followers who have the same boldness, who believe what He said. All authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and earth, and I give it to you. Go to you, therefore, into all the world. And our homes and our businesses and our schools include are part of this world we go into. And so we are to be trained, taught, instructed, being wise unto salvation, be moving beyond the level of intelligence of this world. Uh, there's a lot of intelligent people. I need more intelligence. But I like what one pastor said one time. It made a lot of sense to me. He said, I'd rather go to heaven spouting my ABCs than to go to hell with a PhD. We're making a lot of smart criminals today without being reminded and reminding one another that we're more than just an emotional, mental being. We're body, soul, and spirit. And we have to deal with the spirit. And the spirit cries out for the one who made them, the one who loves them, the one who died for them, and the one who saves them. And this old soul of ours or anybody else's will not be satisfied until it comes into the full knowledge and the wisdom of the one who made them. And that comes by the word of God. Hearing comes by the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Paul just told Timothy, it makes thee wise unto salvation. The contrast that I mentioned at the first is that which begins in verse 1. I don't have time to elaborate on it, but you do need to see it. He's speaking to Timothy and he's warning Timothy. He's speaking to him about the apostasy, the falling away from the faith. He says, This know also, Tim, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. You don't see any students like that, do you, Brother Jerry? They're always obedient to their parents and to their teachers. Yeah, I'm being facetious here. They were like that when I was coming up. I was one of them. Unthankful. Unholy, which means ungodly. And the reason that we curse and cuss and use ungodly language is because we're unholy, we're ungodly. Without natural affection, uh, children not loving their parents, parents not loving their children. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but, not die, but denying the power thereof. He says, Timothy, from such you turn away. And then he says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, laid, led away by, with divers, lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Again, knowledge without Jesus sends you to hell with a PhD. But if you know Jesus, boy, you've, got, you've known everything that you really ever need to know on this earth. And he goes on and says in verse 10, you've known fully how I've lived out my manner of doctrine. I'm just not trying to teach you something as from a textbook, Timothy. I'm trying to show it to you from my life. And when we are honest with ourselves and honest with those that are around us, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, you're an employer or a teacher at school, most of us have somebody under our umbrella of authority or influence. And they will listen to you at first. But if they don't see it lived out in your life, that you're following up on what you say that you believe, what else you say later on begins to fall on deaf ears. And especially for those of us who are Christians, we need to teach it and we need to live it. And therefore, not only proclaim but demonstrate a life of righteousness in our lives. 
If it really makes a difference, then it ought to make a difference in our hearts and in our lives. And those who are new Christians, we give them a little grace. They're just learning. The Bible says they're babes in Christ. But those of us who've been around 20, 30, 40 years, we don't have an excuse. We ought to be mature in the faith, growing each and every day. Now, every year, Coach Clifton and other coaches and teachers have the wonderful pride and joy of graduating a class. And this year will be the class of 22, 2022. And to be there at the ceremony and congratulate them, it's a wonderful accomplishment. And our hats go off to them for work well done. But in the Christian faith, we don't graduate until we get home. We don't graduate until we get home. We're ever learning and coming to the knowledge of the truth. Hey, have you discovered that the scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation? Have you read in that place in John 3, 16 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Have you been wise enough to accept that and to publicly proclaim that? For with the mouth confession is made under salvation. I hope you're wise enough to do that. Well, Pastor, I, I don't really understand all these things. I, I didn't graduate from high school. Some of the best preachers are those that didn't have a good formal education, but they knew God and they knew the scriptures and the power of God. Some of the best Christians didn't have that formal education, but they knew God, and they knew the Scriptures, and they had the power of God upon them, and God blessed their lives. I'm asking you to take God at His Word and become wise in the salvation and step out from where you'll be standing in just a few moments and receive Him. And then let me ask you, while you're teaching your children, parents, to do other things, play ball, do well in school, are you teaching them the most important thing, the Word of God? That's why we think Sunday school is so important. That's why we're doing everything we can do to bring it back on September the 5th, first Sunday in September. That's why your preacher takes the Bible, opens the Bible, and asks you to open your Bible and read what God has to say. It's able to make us wise in salvation, proper for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness that we might live and lead a righteous life in a world that's going in the exact opposite direction. It will be your only help. It will be a true faithful help. And when things change, it won't. You can bank on it, and you can find your safety and security in it. And one day, you are eternal deliverance by believing God's Word. Would you please stand, every head bowed and every eye closed? Let me ask you one more time. Are you wise on the salvation? Have you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior?